If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Now, the stipulation is this. You can't answer for your spouse or for your parents. You have to answer for yourself. Okay? So there's the guideline. I want you to think about these questions this morning as we look at our passage of Scripture. We're going to be talking about a glorious inheritance this morning from Ephesians chapter 1. Question number one. Have you ever made a promise that you've kept? That one's an easy one, right? You're going, of course, I keep my promises. Number two, have you ever made a promise that you didn't keep? Have you ever made a promise that you were incapable of keeping though you wanted to? And the last one, have you ever made a promise with no intention of ever keeping it? We're going to be talking about the inheritance that we have in Christ. I trust that you'll see why I'm talking about promises and keeping promises as we go before we open up in a word of prayer, I just want to remind us of what we've learned about these spiritual blessings in Christ that we have been given as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as we've been working through this passage because we are leading up to the, the, the third from the end of the list that Paul gives in this passage. We were reminded last week that in Christ I am, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I am blessed. In Christ I am chosen. I am predestined. I am adopted. I am accepted. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. And I am enlightened. And this morning we are going to be talking about the fact that in Christ, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am given an inheritance. And so we want to talk about this glorious inheritance this morning as we look into God's Word. Let's pray together and then we'll continue on in our study in Ephesians. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you for the opportunity that we had this morning in our prayer time to just declare to you in prayer what we know you say about your word. And all of the aspects around your word, the scriptures, being reminded that we are encouraged through it, that we are challenged through it, that we are corrected through it, we are, we are blessed by reading it, that it is true that it is consistent, and so much more. God, we are going to, by your grace, learn even more this morning about who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what you've blessed us with, and as we think about this glorious inheritance, Lord God, we Pray that we would have a clear understanding of it and that it would impact our, our lives. I think of anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with you. They are still living their lives the way that they want to live them and they don't really know you and they don't know what they, you've done for them. I pray that you would come to grips, that they would come to grips with the fact that they have no glorious inheritance apart from you and they have no salvation apart from you, and I pray that you would convict them of their sin this morning and that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord today. We pray your blessing on our time in Christ's name. Amen. As we have been, I, I want to continue to do this just as we work through this benediction of Paul at the very beginning of this book that's really laying the foundation for what we're going to learn as we work the rest of the way through the book. And so I just want to read the first 14 verses, and we're going to be focusing on verses 11 and 12 this morning, but follow along with me in your copy of the Scriptures. Paul writes this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, 
to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding." He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in Him. In Him we have also received an inheritance because we are predestined according to the plan of the One who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of His will so that we who have already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to His glory. In Him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. We've talked about it, verses 3 through 14 is really just one big, long, run-on sentence in the Greek. Um, It is Paul's benediction to start. This is a a prayer of praise to Almighty God for all that He's done for the believers, not just in Ephesus, but for believers across all time. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, these spiritual blessings that Paul is praising God for are our spiritual blessings. And we've been working through them, and today we're going to be talking about the glorious inheritance that Paul talks about in verses 11 and 12. And so I just want to reread those verses. He says this, "...in Him, in Christ, we have also received an inheritance," implying that there is believers other than or elsewhere, besides the Ephesian believers, that have received this inheritance. And Paul's saying, look, you and I, we have also received this inheritance. Because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works everything, and works out everything in the agreement, in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to His glory. This is what Paul is talking about, and we want to talk about this inheritance this morning. It is important that we understand that as we read the Scriptures, your English translation may be similar to mine. Mine says, in Him we have received an inheritance. Yours may say the same thing. We have received an inheritance. That's the phrase. In The Greek, it is actually just one compound word. Can you imagine one word in Greek actually gives us that entire phrase? We have received an inheritance. You kind of see why God chose Greek and Hebrew to be the the languages that the Scriptures were predominantly written in because of how precise they are. You've probably heard that in Greek there are three to four different words for the word love, and we've got one. We try to communicate the meaning of love in one word where Greek actually doesn't in at least three other three specific ones. Here we have one compound word that gives us the phrase, we have also received an inheritance. Why do I make a point about that? Well, because actually that phrase in and of itself carries a lot with it that we maybe don't realize. MacArthur puts it this way, when something in the future was so certain that it could not possibly fail to happen, the Greeks would often speak of it as if it had already happened. And Paul actually uses that verb tense, that 
certainty in this phrase. He says, we have received an inheritance. But if you think about the inheritance that Scripture talks about for believers, you would know we haven't got it yet. And yet he's saying we've already received it. There's such a certainty there that when Paul writes this, he's saying, look, it's a guarantee that it's going to happen. And it's such a guarantee that we can actually talk about it as if we've already gotten it, though we anticipate getting it. Paul speaks of something in the future that is sure to happen when he says we have received an inheritance. It's beautiful how the language works. There's something else that's interesting about the phrase, we have received an inheritance. And that's this, that the translation of that phrase or that compound word is actually fairly difficult. It actually can either mean we were made an inheritance, or it can mean we have received an inheritance. My English translation says we have received an inheritance. By the way, both statements are correct if we translated them either way in this passage. And both of them are theologically accurate. The Bible tells us that we actually were made God's possession, God's inheritance, Christ's possession. Psalm 33, 12 says it. Psalm 135, 4 says it. John says it in John 6, 37, 39 um, John 10, 29, 17, verse 2, in Malachi 3, 17, we're told that truth. So we could actually see that translated, we were made an inheritance. We were made God's possession when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the writer here, or the translators here in my scriptures, Translated the other way, we have received an inheritance, which is equally right theologically and in this passage, if we translate it that way. It's consistent with what is said in Colossians chapter 1 and in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 for you. This is what Peter says. It's consistent with what Paul says. These two apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Holy Spirit inspired them to write the Scriptures, it shouldn't surprise us that these two men said very much the same thing. Why? Because we were reminded this morning that Scripture is consistent. Peter says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We have an inheritance. Peter says, we have an inheritance. Paul says, we have an inheritance. In Christ, we have been given an inheritance. Which probably should beg the question, if you're thinking, what's the inheritance? If you look at the passage of Scripture, does it actually tell us what the inheritance is? It says, in Him we have received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who, is, who works out everything in agreement to, with the purpose of His will. So that we, who already put our hope in Christ, might bring praise to His glory. Notice that the inheritance isn't actually described there. Not really. You can infer certain things, but it's not spelled out in this particular passage. I will allude to it, but I actually want to focus on the one who gives us the inheritance and the one who is able to fulfill that. Because that's who Paul's focusing on. He's focusing on Almighty God, the one who gives the inheritance. And it's important to remember who it is that gives the inheritance and why he can give the inheritance, not just the inheritance itself. We struggle with that, don't we? Even as Christians, oftentimes we come to church on Sunday morning and we are hoping to get something out of the service. 
am I off my nut here, or have we had these conversations before? You come, and the preacher preaches, and you hear somebody say, well, you know, I didn't really get anything out of that. And in all fairness, you could go to a church, and you could get absolutely nothing out of the message because it's not grounded in the Word of God. But sometimes we go, and the preacher preaches faithfully from the Word of God, and we say, I didn't get anything out of that. What's the mentality? I'm here to get. Versus, I'm here to worship God. I'm here to give all praise and honor and glory to God. I'm here to focus on the one who is able to work out everything according to the purpose of his will. So when we hear we've received an inheritance, we want to say, what's my inheritance? What do I get? Instead of focusing on the one who gives. I think that it's sometimes important to take a step back and say, wait, not only what do I get, but who's giving it? Who's the giver? Let me focus on the giver. We've looked at the two ways in which it can be rendered. Obviously, we are talking about it from the perspective that we have received an inheritance. Our inheritance As believers in Jesus, we know this. We will one day spend eternity in the presence of our God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will receive glorified bodies free from the sin's curse and corruption. It's more than that, though. It's connected to the very great and precious promises that God gives to us in Scripture spelled out in a variety of different places. Peter actually says it in Second Peter 1, 3 through 4, that he has given to us very great and precious promises. These are a part of the inheritance that we receive from God. What are some of these promises? We are promised love by God. We are promised grace from God. We are promised peace from God and with God. We are promised wisdom We're told that if we lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask, and God gives it to us generously. What a beautiful promise that is. We promise guidance and strength, fellowship with God, spiritual discernment, forgiveness, truth, righteousness. We are promised heaven and eternal riches and glory with God. These things are clear in Scripture. Our inheritance is in Christ. And I want to focus not so much on the inheritance itself, but what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 about our inheritance. Because I believe that it's totally connected to the one who gives us that inheritance. If you have a Bible, I would ask you to flip over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Since Paul says we have received an inheritance in Christ. And Peter says very much the same thing. Peter goes on to tell us a little bit about the quality of that inheritance, if I can put it that way. There are three things I want us to see. First, our inheritance in Christ lasts forever. Why is that important? Well, I I think as we think of the God who gives us that inheritance, we begin to appreciate our inheritance all the more. What does Peter say? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. This is all because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all through the grace and mercy of God our Father. We have this inheritance, and what does Peter say about our inheritance? He says, our inheritance is imperishable. It's immortal. Our inheritance lasts forever. It is certain we cannot lose our inheritance. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about earthly inheritances. How long do they last? 
long as you are, are alive. And then that inheritance doesn't apply to you anymore. You might pass it on to your next generation, but it'll last as long as they either don't squander it or as long as they're alive. That's assuming that the government doesn't come in and tax it to death and take all your inheritance away. Not a dig on the government, by the way, but that's the reality of it, right? Our inheritance here on earth doesn't last. Our inheritance from God lasts for all eternity. It's imperishable. What's the second thing that Peter says about our inheritance? Well, let me take a step back. Instead of kind of summing it up up at the end, I want you to think about it for a second. Think about our inheritance in light of the one who gives it. God is eternal. God's always existed. He will always exist. And when he gives an inheritance, it's in line with who he is. And God says, I'm going to give you an inheritance that is imperishable. It will never go away. And he can back that promise of that kind of inheritance up because God's not going anywhere. Because God's eternal. Number two, Peter says, our inheritance is undefiled or is untainted. There is absolutely no corruption in our inheritance. It's not an inheritance that over time is going to dwindle down. It's, it's not an inheritance that over time is going to fade or, 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 or get uh, corrupted or tainted in any way. It's, it's not going to break down over time. Why? Because God is untainted. He is completely pure. He is completely holy. And so the inheritance that he gives to us is equally untainted. Number three, this inheritance that we have in Christ is durable. Maybe that's not even the best word, but in my translation, it's unfading. As we think about unfading, it doesn't lose its luster. If you could think about it from that perspective, it's always going to be as glorious as it was from the very beginning because God is glorious. But there's another aspect of it. There's another side to it. It's durable. It's unfading in the sense that it doesn't wear out. It's permanent. It's indestructible. You can't spend it all out or spend it all up. You can't have it stolen from you. You can't. It doesn't wear out or it's not, in, it's not destructible the way that we think about it. What if you got an inheritance from somebody and you, so you got an estate? And you got a nice big castle on that estate. Over time, that castle is going to break down. It's going to wear out. You're going to have to start pumping stuff into it to try to keep it either in one piece or keep it going. The inheritance that we receive from God it's permanent. It's indestructible. It's unfading. The God that we serve is more powerful than anything or anyone. Nobody stops God. God's indestructible, if I can put it that way. And the inheritance that he gives us is unfading. As we think about our inheritance the way that Peter describes it, as Paul has just reminded us of something fairly simple and that we have received an inheritance and he doesn't really spell it out much more than that, Peter gives us a little bit of detail about that inheritance that we're going to receive. Paul talks about the glorified bodies that we're going to receive in 1 Corinthians. He talks about, you know, this corruptible is going to put on incorruption this Im this mortal is going to put on immortality that one day at the resurrection this body that i have that's getting old and breaking down and the older we get the more we're in tune with that we see not just the corruption of sin but the corruption of our physical bodies because of the taint of sin when it comes to 
serious illness, but you know, one day we're going to be resurrected and our mortal body is going to be immortal. And our corrupted body is going to be incorruptible. We're going to be able to spend eternity with Almighty God. That's a beautiful thing. As we think about aspects of our inheritance, we really should come back to thinking about the one who has given us that inheritance. Verse 11 says, the one who works out everything according to, or excuse me, in agreement with the purpose of his will. This is the one we're talking about. This is Almighty God. And when we think about the inheritance that he's given, and we think about the precious promises that, we're, that, he, that he's given to us, what do we know? We know that all of these things are going to come to fruition. He always keeps his promises. Why? Because he's Almighty God. And as I think about God, I think about just three areas of his character that are connected to this inheritance and these promises that he's given to us. And I want you to think about it for a minute. Number one, God is good. See, God's promises are good because God's good. His inheritance is good because God's good. Psalm 38 or excuse me, 34, 8, Psalm 100, verse 5, 1 Chronicles 16, 34, talk about the goodness of God. We say the phrase sometimes, God is good, all the time, and all the time God is good. Do we come back to the, the truth of Scripture when the Bible says God is good. Or do we believe the lie that the enemy tries to tell us that, you know, God's not always good sometimes. Hey, the difficulty that you're going through right now, doesn't that mean that God's not very good? Because this situation is not very good. And we have to come back to what the scriptures say. You know what? God is good all the time. God's promises are good. Even though I'm going through this trial in my life, you know what? God's still good. God's going to accomplish His will, and He's going to do it for my good and for His glory, because God's good. And so because God's good, His promises are good. He makes good on His promises because He's good. To the believer, His promises are good because He's good. Our inheritance is good because He's good. Number two, He's able. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that God is omnipotent. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I was talking to somebody just yesterday about creation and what God accomplished in creation. i actually been starting a reading plan just kind of chronologically going through the Bible. And as I was getting into this reading plan, I was challenged to maybe not read the Scripture simply because... to, to to learn, like go through it and say, oh, how does this apply to me or what can I learn from this? But to read the scriptures from the perspective of what can I see about who God is in his character? As I read the scriptures, do I take a step back and I just stand in awe of who, how awesome God is? Kind of easy to do when you're reading through Genesis and God's literally saying, hey, let there be light and there was light. You ever think about how complex light is? Anybody know how fast light, the speed of light is? I don't know. I've forgotten that. You know, you ever thought about just the world and the amazingness of the created world and God spoke that into existence? He said, let, let there be dry land and there was dry land. You ever try that? Go to the river and just say, hey, let there be dry land. See how that goes for you. God just says it and it's done. God's able because God's omnipotent. And if God says that he's going to give these promises, if God says he's going to give this inheritance, guess what? It's a guarantee because God is all-powerful. He keeps his promises. And that passage that we have in Ephesians tells us that the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Why? Because he can. He does it because he can. He does it because he's all-powerful. We serve an all-powerful God. 
Think about what you're going through and you say, look, I, I don't know if I can get help in this. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You serve an all-powerful God. He's either going to provide for the needs that you have or he's going to give you the strength and the grace to get through it. Because we have an all-powerful God. And as I think of people that I know who are facing really a- imminent death because of serious illness, and they're coming to grips with the fact that, you know, God might not actually heal me here. And I'm, and I'm going to taste death. Is God still capable? Is, is God still able? Yes. Because you know what? One day they're going to be resurrected and they're going to be given a glorified body and they're going to spend eternity with their Savior. Why? Because God said it so. And as God raised Jesus from the dead, you know what? He's going to raise us from the dead. Because God's all-powerful. So when God makes a promise, He keeps it because He can. There's never a promise that God makes that He can't keep. Nobody ever prevents Him from keeping His promises. Romans 4.21 says this. Ephesians 3.20 says this. 2 Corinthians 3 or 9.8 says it. Third, We have assurance of this inheritance anchored in God's character because he's true. And his word is true, and we heard that this morning in our prayer time. God cannot lie. He is completely holy and pure, so whatever he says is true, period. Always, every time. So he never makes a promise that he doesn't intend to keep. Though I think if we were honest, all of us at some point probably have done that. Made a promise, but in the back of our mind, we never intended to keep it. What's that make us? Liars. God doesn't make a promise that he doesn't intend to keep because God is true and he always speaks the truth. 2 Samuel 7, 28 says that. Revelation 16, 7 says it. We have an inheritance from God. It's a sure inheritance. So sure that Paul could write it as if we'd already received it, even though we're still waiting. Why? Because it's rooted and grounded in the one who gives us that inheritance, Almighty God. The end of that passage in Ephesians, as Paul's talking about this glorious inheritance that we've received from God, that we can expect from God as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says this at the end of verse 11 into verse 12. He says, so that we who already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. This whole passage This whole section of the letter is Paul praising God for how amazing God is because of the spiritual blessings that he's given to us. And as we think about our inheritance, it should be to the praise of his glory. We should be crying out and praise to Almighty God because of how generous and gracious he is in this inheritance that he's promised to us. But you know what? It's not just voices that bring praise to God but that our lives should bring praise to God. I didn't read Colossians 1, verses 10 and 11, 10 through 11, or 10 through 12, but I want to read it now. This is what Paul says to the Colossian church, which really goes along with the things that we've already been talking as he's written to the Ephesian church. This is what he says, So that you may walk worthy of God. This is how he starts fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in light." In that passage alone, Paul emphasizes two things. We give praise to God and His glory with our voices, but we give praise to God for His his glory in the lives that we live. 
my life should be a life of praise to God. And he says, says it right here, walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. See, if we have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have our identity in Christ, and so we need to live the way that Christ instructs instructs us to live, the way that Christ modeled for us to live. Christ cared for people. How are we doing on our care for people? Christ loved people, loved them enough to point out in their lives where they are straying from God, where they didn't know God as their Lord and Savior, and confronted them on that in a loving way. Christ loved people who were hurting. Christ helped people. Christ gave himself as a sacrifice for people. Do we sacrifice our time and our talents and our energy to serve other people as we serve the Lord? These are just some areas. I got thinking about it in light of the questions that I asked at the very beginning. Talking about making promises. We make promises with our voices, right? Our mouths. Hey, I promise I will do this. Sometimes we do it. And sometimes we don't. And sometimes we are incapable of going, falling through on it. And sometimes we say it with no intention of ever doing it. And Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 5 tells them not to make oaths. You know, hey, I swear I'm going to do this. I swear in my mother's grave I'm going to do that. Like Jesus says, don't do that. He says, as disciples of mine, let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say yes, do it. If you say no, follow through on it. In Colossians chapter two or 3, Paul writing to the believers in, in Colossae, this is what he says. He says, don't lie to one another. Speech. That should not be something that characterizes the life of a believer. So I identify with Christ because Christ is my Lord and Savior and Jesus speaks the truth because Jesus is the truth. And what am I doing as I praise God with my life? I speak the truth. I don't lie to my brother or sister. He goes on, since you have put away the old self and its practices, and you've put on the new self and you're being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of our Creator. Excuse me, I'm re reading the wrong passage of Scripture goes back a little bit. He talks about the fact that there should not be any unwholesome communication that comes out of our mouths. What about that? Just in the way that we speak, what we say and whether or not we follow through on what we say is a way in which we praise God. The Lord, for His glory, not just with our mouths, but with our lives. Christian, have you thought about the inheritance that we, you have in the Lord Jesus Christ? But more than just the inheritance that you have or that you will receive, but the one who gave it to you, the one who's promised it to you. As we think about who God is and what God has done for us, do we fall deeper in love with God to the point where we're saying, you know what, God, whatever you want, I'm going to do because I love you because you first loved me. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I can say is this, this inheritance that we've been talking about is not yours yet. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that if you were to die today, you will be resurrected once again. But Scripture makes it abundantly clear that those who have never given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved through Jesus Christ will be resurrected to judgment and eternity in hell apart from God. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that God's desire is that none should perish and all come to repentance. And so he's given you an opportunity today to hear 
about the Lord Jesus Christ and what Christ has done for you. He died on the cross for you to save you from your sin. His desire is that you would repent of your sin and trust Christ to save you today and experience that inheritance that a believer is promised. It's the same inheritance that God would promise to you and fulfill for you if you trust Christ today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved today.